So, within chapter 4, what we're looking at is kind of the birth of our understanding of atoms. So we already kind of mentioned this. We can look at Dalton's atomic theory. And this is where it first shows up. I know we've seen this slide earlier, but this is where you are now responsible for it. So we need to know some of the key aspects of Dalton's atomic theory. All right? So within this, he came up with his own table of elements. So that's what you're seeing on the right there, not the pretty sun and blue stuff. The thing in the middle, all those weird circles and hatches and cross marks and looks like there's a snowflake in there. Those were the symbols that he assigned to individual elements. All right? So you can see that we've actually done a pretty nice advancement from Dalton's age to now. Because now instead of looking at a periodic table of all sorts of crazy random symbols, we have just a bunch of letters. So that makes things a little bit easier to work with. Okay? He also went through and then said, well, we could combine these elements. And what he noticed is that they combined in varying ratios, okay? in exact ratios. So he kind of broke down his overall thought process behind what was happening with atoms and molecules, and he came up with these rules. Okay? So his first rule is that the element is the smallest particle that we can look at. So when we look at the periodic table, those are the absolute smallest pieces possible. Okay, is this one true? No. Okay, no, you may not know that yet, but we will talk about why that one is false as we move further through the material, or further through the history of chemistry. Rule number two, all <coughs> atoms of an element are identical. <coughs> so that means if I take a carbon atom in my left hand and a carbon atom in my right hand, there is no difference between those carbon atoms. They have the exact same properties. Is that one true? Yeah. If we go through and changed its properties, what happens? Changes the element. So when we're looking at individual elements, an individual atom of an element is the exact same as another individual atom of an element, as long as it's the same type. Um, isn't atomic mass an average? We'll address that, okay? That's looking at a nuance of the subtleties, and there's a slight variation within this, but if we pick an identical atom of carbon and an, another atom of carbon, they have, for all intents and purposes, the same properties. Okay? Rule number three, atoms of different elements can combine to form compounds. Okay, was that one true? Yeah, we can get water. That's a combination of hydrogen and oxygen. Rule number four, compounds contain atoms in small whole number ratios. So what we're looking at is within an individual compound, it has a certain number of atoms, and I can't have a fraction of an atom. Okay, so if I look at the formula for H2O, come on, pen, right through the middle just because I don't have any space. How many atoms of oxygen are in that formula? One. How many atoms of hydrogen? Two. If I go through and change the formula to, say, H3O plus, I've now changed the amount of atoms within this. Do I have the same properties as H2O? No. I've changed the arrangement of atoms around it. It changes the chemical properties overall. Right. We'll talk about H3O2. Um, so there's our whole number ratios, which come out of our formulas. Uh, they also come out of his drawings of molecules, though his drawings of molecules aren't as easy to interpret. Well, or potentially easier, I guess. Right. And we can't look at a fractional atom, meaning there is at no point the formula H. Uh, let's do one, O, oh, a half. Okay, I can't have half an atom. It's got to be a whole number. Okay, so we're looking at a count. And then atoms combine in more than one ratio to form different compounds. That was our H2O versus H3O. Okay, so we can end up forming different species out of these. Out of all of those rules, it's actually kind of impressive. The only one that he really got wrong, or entirely wrong, was number one. There is some variation, as Jeremy was discussing, in number two, but for the most part, two is true. Okay? So he came up in the early 1800s 
pretty much everything that's holds true today. That's actually pretty impressive. At least if you ask me, it's pretty impressive. Right? Looking at very limited chemistries and what he could potentially go through and do to evaluate these things. So the idea is that if we look at, on our far right, our overall symbol here of a, a sun, we can break that sun down into a circle and a whole bunch of triangles that would then be arranged around that sun. Right? Kind of the neat thing about that is we're now also starting to look at a reaction. Right? One side of the arrow is our reactants. The other side of the arrow is our products. Right? Thompson came along in the late 1800s. Okay? So a new scientist came through and tried to refine this. Right? And he ended up finding a couple more subatomic particles. Uh, these were electrons and protons. It's kind of an interesting discovery. It said that really atoms can be decomposed into further pieces. This is our electrons and our protons. And he found the charge species. Is it just electrons and protons? What else is in there? Neutrons. Neutrons. Is there more in there? Just checking to see how far you've read into some of the new science literature. So really, we just have three subatomic particles, and we'll talk about where we got those three. But the electrons and the protons were the first to be discovered. Okay, any ideas why our electrons and protons are easier to discover? They're charged. Okay, and we can think about magnets. Magnets have a, a north end and a south end. And if we bring a north end near a north end, what happens? They repel. Okay, so like charges repel. So if we can somehow generate a bunch of electrons, if I can now bring a more and more electrons, I can see that their paths divert. What's the issue with seeing paths divert? How tiny is an electron? Really, really, really tiny. We can't even see it. So how could we possibly find the existence of these things? Because okay? they are charged. They're incredibly unstable. So how could we ever potentially prove that these things existed? And this is where I think it's fascinating. It all really hinges on the discovery of, nope, electricity came after that. Well, sort of after this. A vacuum. You know that little thing that you clean up your house with? Theory you clean up your house with? Okay. A vacuum cleaner. Okay. To find electrons and protons, we needed a vacuum. Why? Well, if I can somehow generate an electron, it's highly unstable. What happens if it hits anything? If it now reacts, I know how long or have the electron. Okay. Well, does air have anything in it? Very least it has oxygen because we need that to live and breathe. So if there's a molecule of oxygen and I can generate my electron and try and pass it through air, it hits an air molecule, dies. I no longer see the electron anymore. I might see a reactive oxygen species, but I don't see the electron. So if the electron disappears, I have no evidence that I've formed an electron. So how does a vacuum help? Well, what we can do with a vacuum is take a container and remove all of the air from it. If there's now no air present, when I try and push electrons through, the electrons can now move straight through and have no real issue. They'll pass directly through the samples or through the container. This device was known as, okay, not that. I think someone just said it. What was it? Vacuum tube. Vacuum tube, which has another fancier name. Our televisions used to be made out of them. Cathode ray tubes. Okay. Our TVs are based off of this technology. And what ends up happening is we've got this tiny vacuum system, <laughs> and we pump some electric current into the back end of it. That electric current needs to go somewhere. Okay, so we run uh, an electron source, usually at the back, and then someplace to attract those electrons over at the front. The electrons jump through the system and start to move through and towards that positive charge. So they're trying to move through that vacuum system. The process is we can generate an electron beam. Okay? Well, we can't really see electron beam. So how does this? give us evidence that something's actually passing through the sample. Sort of. Okay. 
what ends up happening is these electrons have a lot of energy. And as they go flying through this, some of them hit the glass. The glass now just absorbed a ton of energy and goes, oh, crap, I need to get rid of this energy. So it spits that energy out as light. So we took this system that has absolutely nothing in it. We pump in a bunch of electric current in one end, and all of a sudden there's light coming out of this tube. Seems a bit odd. Okay? It's odd because there's nothing in it. There's no reason it should give off light because there's no elements in it. Well, if elements are the absolute smallest particle possible, okay, there's nothing of that there, then I shouldn't see any light. There's no reason for it to emit anything. So what does that mean? There's got to be something smaller than elements. That smaller piece, in this case, was our electrons. Okay, how did we decide what the charge was? Okay, well, negative repels from negative. So what we can do is use a magnet. And we can stick a magnet up against our cathode ray tube. Okay, if the charges happen to align, negative to negative, what happens to the electron beam? Negative to negative, it repels. And what we end up seeing is instead of the end of our tube fluorescing, or even the bottom where our positive charge is, we see the top of the tube starting to glow. What if I put the other end of the magnet there? It's going to pull it downwards, and now I see the bottom of the tube glowing. So what we can do is start to determine something about the charge of these particles. And that was really the birth of our electrons. Well, how did we get protons then? Okay. Are our atoms charged? Atoms are neutral. Well, if atoms are made up of electrons that are negatively charged, that would say they're not neutral. So what does that necessarily mean must also be present in the atom? Positive a positive charge to cancel the negative charge. So the existence of our electrons gives us secondary evidence that we have protons. Kind of a neat effect. Okay, and this was kind of Thomson's contribution to this. Okay. He then went through, once he knew that he had electrons and protons, tried to come up with some idea to describe the atomic structure. So how did we make an atom? Okay, well, as one of the things that he observed is that as we added more electrons and protons, our atom structure changed. We got to a different atom. So he went through and proposed that what we've got is an atom is a collection of electrons and protons. And because our atoms are neutral, I'm going to have an equal amount of electrons and protons. Okay, and he said, well, the simplest way to do this is that we have our atom within a confined space, and what's in that space is the number of electrons and protons, just free-floating everywhere. Okay? And he decided to call this the plum pudding model of the atom. Okay? If you go through and look at the textbook, they go through a little bit further definition of this. In plum pudding, I think you've got raisins, and he decided that the raisins were the electrons, I believe. I think there's a random question on that. It's not a question I would ever ask, but... You might see that in the textbook, or you might see that in your homework. Okay. So he's got this kind of theory on what our atoms look like. Just a mixture of electrons and protons. That's all his theory is. Okay. And that gets called our plum pudding model, okay. which might bring up an issue. And when we think about this, you've got to get tested on this. What equation would you use to derive There isn't one. What calculation would you do? There isn't one. So what kind of questions would I ask on an exam? Purely memorization questions based off of the history. Okay. That history is something that I'm trying to sort of bring alive. And by your excited faces, I can see I'm doing such a great job of that. Okay. But what we're looking at is some kind of historical perspective. And we're trying to bring in and mention these kind of famous guys because they did some kind of cool stuff. All right. One of the big things that he could really only do was calculate the mass to charge ratio of our protons and electrons. So we didn't really know the exact mass of it. All right. So a new experiment came in. This one isn't in your textbook. Uh, this came back to uh, two scientists, Milliken and Fletcher, and my personal 
perspective would be it was primarily Fletcher. Okay, Milligan was the primary investigator. Okay, so he's the one that got his name attached to all of this. Okay, Fletcher was the one that actually went through and did the experiment. So what he did, said, okay, we've got these things electrons. We're going to take a little cover and I'm just going to spray oil. Okay, real fancy, right? Just spray oil droplets out. We make this mist. That mist is going to fall downwards due to gravity. And eventually what will happen is one of those random little mist droplets will fall through a tiny little slit. As soon as it falls through that tiny little slit, now the experiment begins. Okay? And what he does is he stares in the end of a microscope looking for that droplet. Okay? Once he sees that droplet, he can start to make some estimates of size. Okay? How big is that droplet? The next part he can go through and do is within these plates, okay, within that chamber, there's a charge. He's putting an electric charge across it. Okay, well, our oral droplets have a slight charge associated with them. So what ends up happening is he can change the amount of electric current. Okay, and in the process of that electric current, he can counteract gravity. So at the exact point that he's counteracting gravity, he can then relate that charge relationship back to the mass, and he can determine the mass of our electrons and protons. How do you do this? Literally like you did. You stare at a microscope, you see a little droplet, real quickly start spinning some knobs, try and get it to levitate. As soon as it levitates, then you can start to control and refine the electric current to make sure it's dead center. You've now completely counteracted the forces of gravity. You can do a bunch of physics to see what our, calculate the mass of that particle is. What happens as the oil droplet falls through if you don't spin the electric current fast enough? Hits the, Hits the bottom. What does that mean? Squeeze your little oil dropper thing again. Wait to catch another one. You do it once. Do it one time, you might get some idea of the measurement. Okay? But you'll probably have a lot of error associated with it. Remember, you're spinning that dial like crazy. Okay? So how many times do you probably have to do this? hundreds if not thousands of times. And then average all of those results and he ended up with these calculations, okay? With a mass of both the electron and the proton. You'll notice that those masses are what? Tiny. Ridiculously tiny. Do you need to have those masses memorized? Yes. No, I won't make you memorize those. So I will supply those on an exam if I think you're gonna use them. I might supply them on the exam even if I don't think you're gonna use them. Okay, just to make sure that you're using the information appropriately. Which of those is bigger? The proton, the proton is a bigger number because we're only going 10 to the minus 4 as opposed to 10 to the 28th. Okay? How much bigger? 1, Factor of 4. Right? So let's scale it maybe the other direction. Right? As by a factor of 10 to the fourth, which equals 10 to the fourth. Okay. We looked at salaries. If I made 10,000 times more than you did, is that a big difference? Yes, I don't make 10,000 times more than you. Okay. It's probably actually not that far off. Okay. It is a massive difference. So massive that if we try and look at the mass of a proton versus an electron, we really don't look at the mass of an electron. Okay, if we put a proton and an electron together, okay, we would say our total mass is really just the mass of the proton. The electron doesn't contribute enough mass to actually change the weight. Because okay, you're looking at adding a, effectively a one three decimal places away. Okay? Next part of this, I, I kind of like this one too. Rutherford, interesting guy. Okay. This is a lot of where science happens. Remember we had Thompson came through and said this is the model of the atom, plum pudding model. Everything just floats around in a sea. Okay. Well, what happens if you happen to be a scientist that's like, you know what, I really like Millikan, or sorry, Thompson. I want to help prove that his theory is true. Well, we'll design an experiment 
to try and test that theory. Okay? And that's kind of what Rutherford sort of doing. Okay? So what he ended up going through and doing was taking atoms, okay? a gold leaf, right in the middle of this surface. Okay? And since it's made of gold and we have the plum pudding model, there's really nothing massive in there. Okay? Remember, the mass of your proton is tiny. Okay? So virtually no mass. Okay? He then takes a source of alpha particles. Alpha particles are radiation. Okay? It's a really highly energetic helium atom. So it has some mass. And he takes that helium atom and he launches it at the gold foil. Okay, well, what would happen? Okay, if our atoms are really just a random sea of protons and electrons, as soon as we file that part fire that particle at it, what's going to happen? They should just pass straight through. Okay? We don't see anything different. Well, that's a kind of boring experiment, but hey, if Thompson's model was true, that would be valid. The particle passes straight through the sample, and we would detect that alpha particle at the other end of the sample, completely straight through. Okay? So if Rutherford actually believed Thompson and said, you know what, I'm going to prove you're right, okay? I, would agree, I would think that this experiment's going to be slightly tweaked. You'll notice that what he's got around the outside of this is a detector. That's what's going to detect the alpha particle. If all he wanted to do was prove Thompson correct, all he needs is a little piece of detector right here. Why? It'll pass straight through. Oh, look, I proved my result. The particles pass straight through. I see them all right here. That means... Thompson's model of the plum pudding must be valid, right? Did he just use that tiny little detector? No, he put it all the way around. All right, there's two arguments for why he put it all the way around. Number one is being a scientist. We've got to test all possible results. Number two, didn't like Thompson. <laughs> Thought Thompson was full of crap. His theory was horrible. He had a better one. Okay. What his better theory was was that we don't have this random sea of particles. Right? There has to be something that holds a big solid mass somewhere within the atom. And if there is that solid mass in the atom, what happens when he fires another mass at it? It bounces. And if it bounces, he should be able to detect that somewhere on the other side of our detector. Sure enough, he fires it at it, and what do we see? Particles bounce. What does that mean happens to Thompson's model? Hits the garbage can. Right? No longer valid. We have now built an experiment to disprove Thompson's model. So now we need a new model. What's that new model? Rutherford's model. Okay. Rutherford's model. What might we describe within Rutherford's model? He's saying that we have to have a mass that's solid enough that it can actually impact other things. So what things would I collect together to generate a mass? Protons or electrons? Protons. Why? They're 10,000 times heavier than an electron. So what we're doing is going to collect all of the protons into one super dense place. Okay? Odds are still that our electron or our alpha particles will pass through, but every so often it'll hit that super dense uh, center of protons and bounce back. So Rutherford's model is that we've collected all of our massive particles and we put them in the same spot. Okay? It's a lot of awful words to go along with that. So he wanted to come up with a name to attach to that. What do we call that super dense conglomeration of protons? It's the nucleus. What happens with the electrons? The electrons are now free-floating on the outside. Okay? We still don't have an explanation of where the electrons exist within our atom. They're just somewhere floating around. Okay? But we now have the existence of a super-dense nucleus. Okay? Kind of a neat observation and a neat experiment to go with it. Okay? Another kind of history lesson on this. I'm only for, sort of full of some of these. Where did the alpha particles come from? I said they were super highly energetic helium atoms. 
that come from a radioactive source. Okay, well, radiation, radioactivity, that's not a very common process in nature. Okay? I mean, we can find it, but when we do find it, it's usually a mix of all sorts of other elements that are radioactive as well. And they aren't giving off just alpha particles. They're giving off other things. So if we're going to set this experiment up, do we want a source that just gives alpha particles or just gives out a crap ton of whatever the heck it wants? Well, if we got a crap ton of whatever the heck it wants, we can't predict what's going to happen as soon as those random weird things hit that <coughs> gold foil. So what we want for our source is something incredibly pure that only gives off these alpha particles. Because if it gives off anything else, I can't control that variable. That means I can't draw conclusions from my experiment. Okay. Any ideas where we can buy these alpha particles or obtain them nice and cleanly? An element known as radium. What's special about radium? Really low on the periodic table. We're looking at element 88 right next to francium, far left. Okay. Highly unstable, okay. very impure in the natural source. So somebody has to come along and come up with a way to isolate this element away from all of that other junk so Rutherford can do his experiment. Because without that pure source here, we got nothing. Right, and this is an interesting process. Anybody know who discovered radium? Yeah. It's Mary Curie. It's Mary Curie. Okay. Fun fact about Mary Curie. Oh, uh, that's also a fun fact. <laughs> She's female. Why is that a fun fact? When were these discoveries made? Early 1900s. <laughs> Early 1900s. What's the issue with that? Women couldn't even vote. Virtually no rights. And yet, Mary Curie was somehow able to isolate radium. Okay, pretty fascinating. She was actually allowed into a lab. Oh my God, a woman in the lab. Okay, isolated this compound. This purification scheme is of critical importance because without the radium source, Rutherford can't do his experiment. We have no idea what the nucleus looks like. So that's kind of important. Translate that now to today's science. Someone makes this astronomical discovery. What do they do with that astronomical discovery? Oh, come on. They patent it and say, you need to give me money, otherwise you can't use my research. What did Curie do with her development? Passed it along, completely open access. Gave everybody access to her results and how to go through and purify this. So Rutherford could obtain his radium. Okay? Removed the economics from the situation and gave complete access to information. Why is that important? Well, education is something that should be available to everybody, not just the select wealthy few okay, that have enough to pay for a patent. So Curie was way ahead of her time in that respect. Okay. Next fun fact about Curie. Yeah, she died of cancer because she did a lot of work with radiation and radioactive particles. Interesting thing about those radioactive particles is they do cause cancer. There are stories of her carrying around her radioactive samples, and I don't have one, you know, pockets on her shirt, pants, that kind of thing. So imagine just walking into the lab, pulling out a sample of uranium. Oh, yeah, just la, 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 la. Okay. That's kind of the extent of what they were doing at that point with those samples. Okay. So, yeah, she did die of a cancer that was likely due to all of the radioactivity that she was exposed to. Okay. Unfortunately, she didn't become spider woman. Other fun fact. This one, I think, is also kind of cool. So not only does she supply this information, the Nobel people actually acknowledge the fact that she supplied this information, and she won a Nobel Prize. Okay. First woman to get the Nobel Prize. Pretty impressive. Particularly, again, women couldn't even vote. You had no rights as a woman. And she wins the Nobel Prize. Take it a step further. Not only did she win one, she won two Nobel Prizes. Okay. Take it even further, she is the only person, male or female, to win two Nobel Prizes in different fields. 
cry. Incredibly amazing what this woman could go through and do. Okay? So if you have the ability, you have the knowledge, it's useful. You can go out and you can find new amazing discoveries. You just need a little bit of help to get you there. Okay? So kind of a neat person. Sort of get off my soapbox when we move forward. Okay? So his conclusion was that we have a nucleus. That super dense nucleus, what happens when our alpha particles come through? They hit that nucleus, they bounce back. There we go, the birth of a nucleus. Okay. We could go through and look at sizes of our nucleus to get an, an idea of how tiny the nucleus is. Okay. If we take a look at an atom, make it the size of the superdome. The nucleus of that atom is the size of a marble. Okay, so we're taking all of that positive charge, all those protons, and we're smashing them into an incredibly small place. Okay, very impressive uh, kind of the size and scale of that. Okay, that gives us protons and electrons. I would argue that this discovery also gives us the discovery of another particle. What's that other, excuse me, particle? Neutron. Why does it give us the discovery of a neutron? How else do the protons stay together? Protons are all positively charged. What happens when you bring a proton near a proton? They repel. They repel. Okay, so if I take all of these protons of these atoms and I smash them all into the size of our, mar our marble, okay, they're all going to want to bounce away from each other. They're going to want to get away as far as we can. We need something to hold those protons near each other. Okay, what those... What that something is, is our neutron. Okay? So the neutron, we can theorize just based on that basic understanding of our like charges repelling from each other. Okay? There's another big piece of evidence behind the existence of protons. Okay, this one kind of goes back to our atomic structure. Hydrogen. How many protons? One. Helium? Three. Lithium? Three. How do you know it's three? What was it one, two, and three? We've got this little symbol in the upper right-hand corner that refers to the atomic number. That atomic number represents the number of protons within our structure. Okay. Let's take it a little bit further. Our electrons have what mass? Negligible. Negligible. So let's go through and say a proton weighs an arbitrary unit, one. Let's just make it one, nice and simple. So based on our arbitrary unit system, the mass of hydrogen should be one. The mass of helium, two. What's the mass of helium? Our mass is written underneath the element symbol, and its mass is four. What? If the only thing that contributes mass is the proton, how did I jump up from two to four? <coughs> something else needs to be there. What's that something else? It's the glue holding the protons together, because otherwise they'd repel. And what we end up noting is that for every proton, we get roughly one neutron. So when we move up to lithium, what happens? We now have three protons. We would expect a mass of three. But I said roughly, you get one neutron per proton. So our mass should be six. Eh, sort of. You close your eyes and ignore the last two digits. Okay, you get six. You'll notice also as you look at these that we don't get exact numbers. It's not just six or four or two. We do get these kind of weird decimal values coming out of it. And we'll talk about that. That comes back to, I guess it was rule two, two of Dalton's theory. Okay. So we've got protons, neutrons, and electrons. Big things to remember within this. Uh, let's see, do I actually have it summarized nicer here? I do not. Your electrons are located outside the nucleus. The protons and neutrons are located inside the nucleus. The charge of an electron is negative. Okay. You'll notice that we say relative charge. Because right? we're going to compare the charge of a proton to the charge of an electron. So without having to bring in all sorts of other weird numbers with what the exact charge is and in what units, we just say relatively 
<coughs> the electron is negative, and the proton is positive. The neutron has no charge. Right? So we don't have to worry about the neutron. The next part goes back to mass. The proton and the neutron have approximately the same mass. The electron has 1 divided by 1836, the mass of a proton. So ridiculously tiny. So in most cases, we can ignore the mass of the electron. Okay? What we're going to end with is looking at our atomic notation. <clears throat> We've got a lot of information stored up in our periodic table. We need to start to pick up where some of this information is located. Okay? Your textbook refers to this as atomic notation. I think it's a little bit better to refer to it as the nuclear uh, notation because it's looking at the numbers of protons and neutrons, which are only found in the nucleus. So with this terminology or with this symbology, we're really only concerned about the nucleus. We don't care at all about what's happening with our electron count. So with this notation, each element will use the symbol, which you all memorize those 36 to 50 elements, right? You're working on memorizing those 36 to 50 elements. We can throw in its symbol. The next part is the two numbers that we would add in next to it. Okay? A in the upper left-hand corner is the mass number. That's a representation of the amount of protons and neutrons within that individual element. Okay? The number below that is the atomic number. You will notice that when you look at the periodic table that we don't hold true to the same notation. Okay? That is unfortunate, but that's just the way it works. Okay? So let's take a look at an example on this. Okay, the example here is silicon. What I'm saying for silicon is that my atomic number is 14. Where is silicon on the periodic table? Where is carbon? Okay. Silicon is right underneath carbon. What's the number in the upper right-hand corner on our periodic table? 14, which represents the atomic number for our element. Yes, you'll notice it is all sorts of out of whack with our uh, nuclear model. Okay? That's just the way it works. In the upper left-hand corner, 29 is the number of protons and neutrons together. So if we break this down, the element is... Silicon. Okay. The atomic number is 14. Our mass number, 29. Whoops, that was way more information. Oh, no, that's fine. What's the number of... Uh... No, I don't want that yet. Okay, so our mass number is just 29. What's the number of protons? Oh, that's right there above it. According to our atomic number, that gives us the number of protons within it. If our mass number is 29, that is equal to the number of our protons plus the number of our neutrons. So how many neutrons do we have? Oh, that you guys guessed already? You're looking at 29 minus 14. We're at 15 neutrons. Okay, so it's just a question of processing through that to determine how many protons and neutrons are in there. Based on this symbol, do we know how many electrons are present? No. Kind of hard to tell. Your electrons will typically get represented as a balance of charge in the upper right-hand corner. What is the number there? What number is written there? Upper right-hand corner. What's that number? Within the box, what number is in that box? Zero. What's the number within the box on our silicon? Zero. What does that mean? The charge is zero. So our charge is going to be equal to the number of protons times its charge, charge on a proton, plus the number of electrons times the charge on an electron. You can pack up. It's okay. Number of protons, we said, was 
14, what's the charge on a proton? Plus 1. What's the number of electrons? I don't know. That's a variable, x, which equals, or sorry, with the charge on electrons, negative 1, which equals our overall charge, which was 0. Solve for x, 14. This notation actually tells us that we have 14 electrons. Okay. We'll come back to that with an example probably, I think. Uh, not quite yet. We'll end up moving to chapter 5 after our atomic notation.